As we warmly welcome ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together to welcome Lieutenant General M.U. Nair from the prestigious Indian Army who will talk about his journey of creating impact even when the data that you and I are talking about is sketchy and scarce. A warm, warm welcome to you. Thank you very much for joining. And Manish, if we can please request you to do the honors. Here's all of us thanking you for gracing the stage with your presence. Over to you. Thank you, Shiga. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an it's a absolute pleasure for me to be here for the Economic Times uh, DataCon Summit 2022. And it's, uh, it's probably a unique uh, experience, I'm sure, for all of you also, as much as uh, for me, because I don't think any serving officer normally comes and speaks on such forums. Uh, the reason why we are attempting to speak on uh, forums like this is because we have uh, uh, ventured out into, into new areas of technology expertise. We seek a lot of assistance from the industry partners, like the additional secretary was just mentioning. Uh, the armed forces, I'm sure you're aware that you know, we are completely data-driven today. And we have considerable deficiencies, despite the fact that we have a very highly potent technologies back-end support system, which we have. But despite that, we have shortcomings. And without the key partnership of the industry, the academia, the DRDO, all of them are players. And without their uh, active support, we are actually going nowhere in, in, in this era of uh, technology proliferation. Uh, I, I just wanted to give you a big, brief background on what I did in my journey of, in the Army of 38 years. I, I joined the National Defense Academy at the young age of 16 years, way back in 1981. And I joined the Army at, in 1984. Uh, when I joined the Army at that point of time, most of our communications, I joined the Corps of Signals, which was actually looking after the communications domain, providing support to the, the field army in terms of communication support as also data support. There were hardly any data. Most of the communications at that point of time was uh, voice-centric. Over a period of time, uh, the technology changed so dramatically. In the Army, we had the Army Radio Engineered Network. Like when I joined, it was all teleprinter-based communications, Pan India. That point of time, I don't think any of you would have seen a teleprinter with a tape relay system, which is actually giving us, uh, you know, the, the the connectivity as also the the messaging system we had was based on a teleprinter. You would have seen the old fax machines which were there in the PNT, SOL, PNT, and the DOT. That was a type of communications we had first years, as also the combat net radio. We migrated from that to uh, ARIN, that is an Army Radio Engineered Network. We had radio-based voice and data communication of a very limited capability, uh, which was for our mechanized formations, primarily operating in our border areas. Uh, this was in the early 80s. We transformed ourselves into uh, uh, an, a setup called the ASCON, which came up in late 80s, early 90s, the Army Static Switch Communication Network, which was a static network supporting both voice and data to a large extent, but it was only focusing along our border areas. So hinterland communication, the, the portions of Northeast did not have good connectivity at that point of time. And later, we migrated ourselves into the automated message switching system, which was a pan-India messaging platform, which we had in the mid-90s. Uh, That's probably the first largest messaging platform in the country at that point of time. Uh, from there, we migrated onto the, the mobile cellular systems. So, 95, we started the cellular revolution in the country with the spectrum being uh, you know, used very, very extensively. Till the early 90s, we, the maximum utilization of the spectrum in the country was actually probably by the armed forces. And uh, subsequently, uh, with the cellular services proliferation in the country. So we also moved on to an era of mobile cellular systems where our, uh, some of our field formations got the mobile cellular systems in early 2000s. So that was a progress with which we made. But uh, since the cellular revolution actually overtook everything, so we uh, at that point of time, we realized that in the Army that we, are, we need, needed to catch up with technology. Uh, we, from the automated message system, we migrated to a messaging platform called the Army Wide Area Network, which came up in the early 2000s. And from there, again, we have very recently switched on to a very secure messaging platform called the ASIGMA, which was launched only really a couple of months back. 
So this is the journey which I have seen in the, in the army where we have actually changed, caught up with technology. But what I mentioned is only about the messaging system and the communications backbone. There's a lot more happening in the army insofar as technology is concerned. I come from an institution where it's supposed to be the center of excellence on artificial intelligence, on, uh, on uh, uh, space-based communications, on electromagnetic spectrum operations, on cyberspace operations. So we spend a lot of time on, uh, on artificial intelligence, like the additional secretary was just mentioning. We have a special domain where we focus on a lot of uh, tools, which uh, developing tools, algorithms, which are of use to us in solving the everyday problems in field areas. So we are working on solutions. Uh, in this process of uh, gathering uh, or making people connect, we have uh, hordes of hordes, you know, large volumes of data which is being generated. Now, probably the military had the largest volume of data in yester years, but most of them were in the legacy forms, you know, in, 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 a, in a written format. So they all came into a, into a normal digitized form subsequently, and we have hordes and hordes of, of, of volumes of data which, which, are, which are derived from our sensors, which are all across the IBLC, LAC, all along our border areas. We have a lot of volumes of data of our HR logistics systems which are there. Now, how do we utilize this is a big challenge for us at this point of time. I have, we have ventured into a lot of uh, types, memorandums of understanding with academia, industry. Quite a few academic uh, industry partners are working with us for solving the puzzles in the data domain. But the major challenge which you are facing is that, like, how to take forward the, the legacy data and then you know, take it forward and then make it combined with the modern data formats. We have many systems which are still analog driven in our areas al along the IBLC, LAC. Uh, many of them are uh, in, in primitive formats. I headed an organization, we used to get about 1.5 lakh uh, inputs in a day on multiple formats. It could be video, it could be audio, it could be textual, it could be uh, audio which is distorted, very poorly uh, uh, captured, uh, video formats, pictures, photos, which are taken in fog conditions, foggy conditions, in uh, very, very inclement weather conditions. Now, how do you utilize it for our operational, utilize, I mean, uh, for, for our field formations to get information is a major challenge which we are addressing at this point of time. Uh, how do you refine data? You know, uh, carry out cleansing of this data is a major challenge how do you store it? Is, yes, storage is possible. Then how do you make multiple compartments, you know, these data, like let's say uh, the HR-related information which we have. It is required by multiple agencies. Now, while many of them are in the legacy format, some of them are in newer formats, so how do you make them talk to each other? How does the user, it could be an operational man, it could be a logistic man, it could be a HR manager. Now, how does he use it? These are the, the current challenges we are, uh, we are uh, you know, dwelling upon at this point of time. Uh, I had an institution uh, where we have about 1,000 trainees uh, in the age group from 18 to 45. I have young, uh, young uh, cadets who are doing their BTEC program in my institution, 18 to 22. They do their BTEC in electronics and telecommunication engineering. We have officers from in various seniority brackets who are coming there. We have a lot of troops, men who are extremely brilliant. They make their own software programs. They make, you know, we throw challenges at them. They give you results. But all of, all of it is actually revolving around the data sets which we have. And that, and that is where uh, we look forward, look towards each of you uh, who are industry experts, experts in these domains. Now, we studied the patterns which are there in other countries too. And I realized that, you know, many of the countries are facing similar challenges. Uh, you, uh, I'm sure there's an officer from uh, the U.S. Armed Forces who is also going to address you. Similar challenges are being felt there also. They have organizations which are looking exclusively at data. We also have similar organizations, but we have not been able to make too much of headway in, in getting all the data together, uh, making it uh, optimally utilizing them, and then, you know, the end results to the field formation so that they can get instantaneous intelligence. I mentioned to you about an organization which we are getting about 1.5 million, uh, 1.5 lakh inputs in a day to get them into something which is intelligence-worthy from that information or whatever that, that 
particular format to get into some uh, information of int value, it required a human interface. It was not possible for us to use analytical tools because they were in very, very different uh, uh, formats. Like, I know uh, some of you would, may not imagine the, the fathom, I mean, the, 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 the problem statement is that the, the data we capture, be it, be it audio, be it video, they were of uh, multiple languages, multiple dialects. Some of them were encrypted. Some of them, some of them were tones. Now, to get them decrypted, demodulated, or demodulated and decrypted, the images into some structured format was a major challenge. Even today, it remains a challenge for us. Carrying out analysis of it, correlating it with our database, which is existing, and then deriving intelligence out of it is, is a challenge which the armed forces are facing across the, across the world today. Now, when you talk about int failures, et cetera, one of the reasons is that the data which we capture is, is so humongous in volume. And uh, it, it, correlating all of them and getting something out of it is, is it's a challenge. Uh, we have a lot of partners, like many of you are, uh, I'm sure some of you are already associated with projects. So we look towards each one of you, if you can assist us in our endeavor to transform ourselves, to refine ourselves, uh, it will be a wonderful measure. It will be, uh, uh, and today, I'm sure the ongoing conflicts are all based on information superiority. And how do you derive, how do you get information superiority in a multi-domain operation scenario? Is, is only data which can actually give you success. So that is where we are struggling with at this point of time. Success stories are plenty. We have a lot of operations which have been successfully carried out based on very good intelligence derived out of data which we have culled out from places. Uh, we are also looking at predictive analysis. Now that's where our AI tools, AI labs are working on at this point of time. It, uh, there are bottlenecks, there are uh, challenges. Uh, forums like this are where we are looking at. Uh, the additional secretary mentioned about the governmental efforts on uh, on um, on, on the niche technology domains. Now, the major problem we face is that while the technology is so rapidly changing, our procurement uh, models do not, we not actually, uh, are not aligned to the pace with which the technology is changing. The government of India has actually looked at these issues. I'm sure you're all aware of the DAP 2020, which has an ICT chapter, which is exclusive. We have the Army Design Bureau, which is interacting very closely with the industry now, working on the problem statements of the field army, trying to make differences, making a, a, a you know, trying to make challenges. Uh, in fact, there are so many uh, forums today where the industry can actively participate, like the IDEX is one of them. We have a lot of procurement uh, heads under which even the field formations under the army commanders, special financial powers, a lot of projects can be done equipment can be taken, systems can be delivered. So the opportunities for the industry is, is actually uh, quite a few in numbers. What we look, look towards, all of you, is that you need to come to us. We will give you problem statements. Can we solve this puzzle of data and then make it more useful for carrying out operations in this era of niche technology is what we are today uh, attempting to solve. Uh, the reason why I have come and spoken to you is because we require a lot of support from all of you, from the industry. Uh, we have MOUs with the academia today. We are doing projects. The, the institution I am heading is going in for a, a 5G testbed very shortly. So in terms of networks, we have very vast reach today. I am sure many of you would have heard about the network, network for Spectrum. That's the project Kranti where the armed forces will have its own exclusive network. Now, having mere data is not enough. You need to port the data through networks. So we have exclusive network coming up, which should roll out very shortly. These are the networks which will provide us with the connectivity to the, the entire uh, country. We have, this is an exclusive network of ours. We have our own data centers coming up. We have, uh, in technology-wise, in terms of reach, we have everything. But we require solutions for making our data uh, more uh, useful to our organizations for carrying out uh, the successful operations. That's the reason why I'm here to speak to each one of you. Uh, look forward to very close interaction between the civil, you know, this is all civil military fusion is all about. Today, unless the civil 
the, the military, the academia, the DRDO, we all sit together. Uh, it's, it's not going to make uh, a meaningful uh, effort towards our problem-solving exercise. Uh, with that, I think I'll, um, I, I'm extremely grateful to Economic Times for having called us over here and uh, looking forward to a wonderful session. And you can contact me if you have any, sol any, any specific uh, uh, solutions to the problems which I addressed to you about, spoke to you about, and uh, looking forward to a lot of interaction with each one of you. Thank you very much.